Okay, welcome to my session today. Today on Surgery Clinics, we'll be discussing the problem of abdominal mass, a very important condition in surgery. Now, what is abdominal mass? By definition, an abdominal mass is any abnormal growth that occurs within the abdomen. And the abdomen can be divided into three parts. The anterior abdominal wall, also known as the preperitoneum, the peritoneal cavity proper, which is known as the intraperitoneal, and the thirdly, the retroperitoneum behind the peritoneum. Okay, this diagram shows you the preperitoneum, okay, which is the anterior abdominal wall here. Then you've got your intraperitoneal, where the organs are located. And the other one is posteriorly the retroperitoneum behind the peritoneum, which where the peritoneum is reflected lines the posterior abdominal wall. Okay, this first picture here shows you the peritoneal cavity. This peritoneal cavity, as I said, is uh, occupies the whole of the abdomen, huh? and the important organs in this peritoneal cavity are liver stomach and intestines okay these are the main organs that fill up the peritoneal cavity and this peritoneum is lined by two layers of peritoneum the visceral peritoneum which lines the organs and the parietal peritoneum which lines the, the outer layer which lines the whole of the abdominal cavity and here in this picture it shows you the retroperitoneal cavity the retroperitoneal cavity is an important cavity because although it is not as spacious as the intraperitoneal cavity, it contains very important organs, especially the iota and its branches, the vena cava and its tributaries that drain into it, the kidneys on either side. Then you have the second and third part of the duodenum, which is plastered by this peritoneum onto the peritoneal, uh, posterior abdominal wall and the pancreas, the whole of the pancreas. Then lower down, you have the iliac vessels which come out from the uh, iota and the bladder and uterus. Okay, these are all extra peritoneal or retroperitoneal cavity. Okay, for convenience, the abdomen can be divided into four large quadrants. Okay, here you've got the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, and left lower quadrant. Okay, and each of these quadrants contain or, uh, the various important organs within. In the right upper quadrant, the three main ones are the liver, stomach, and the gallbladder, and part of the duodenum. And in the left upper quadrant, is the stomach, spleen, and the pancreas. The right lower quadrant, appendix, right colon, and right ovary in females. And in the left lower quadrant, you have the colonic diverticula and the left ovary in females. It also contains, uh, carries your uh, descending and sigmoid colons in the lower abdominal, uh, lower left lower quadrant. The kidneys, on the other hand, occupies both the upper and the right quadrants on either side, on the right and left. Okay, uh, some people like to uh, further divide these four quadrants into nine regions as shown here. Upper one is the right hypochondrial region, epigastric region, and the left hypochondrial region. The middle zone is the right lumbar region where the kidney is located, umbilical region, mainly the intestines and part of the uh, pancreas and stomach is also located here. The left lumbar region, which carries the left, which contains the left kidney and the left ureter, and the lower zone is the right iliac region, which mainly the appendix and the ovaries and the cecum, hypogastric region, which contains the bladder and the uterus, and the left iliac region, 
which contains the left colon and rectal sigmoid areas. Okay. The other important thing is to uh, know the organ of origin of your abdominal mass. Okay, these are the number of conditions, the organs which can give rise to the various abdominal masses liver, hepatoma, stomach, cancer, spleen, okay, splenomegaly, gallbladder, gallstone problems, kidneys, colon. On the right is yours, right colon, the ascending colon, and cecum. On the left is the descending colon, sigmoid, and rectum. The small intestine, which occupies almost all of the quadrants, and the appendix, mainly in the right lower quadrant. Then you have the cecum, the pancreas, ovary, urinary bladder, uterus, abdominal wall, the anterior abdominal wall, and also the retroperitoneal soft tissue structures, which can give rise to soft tissue tumors. Now, what are the definite masses by uh, going by the organ of origin? In the liver, it can be due to liver abscess, hepatitis involved resulting in hepatom uh, hepatomegaly, metastatic masses, and primary tumors, hepatoma or hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay, this can cause massive uh, hepatomegaly and a mass in the upper outer quadrant. Then the stomach can give rise to uh, lesions, masses, especially carcinoma of the stomach and gastro gastric outlet obstruction leading to a massive uh, dilated stomach and sometimes it can also cause leiomyomas. Gallbladder, the tumors or the masses arising from the gallbladder may be due to empyema in which case it would be tender, mucosal, carcinoma of the gallbladder, and the various bile duct cancers. Left colon on the left side of the abdomen is arising from the descending and rectosigmoid and rectum. The most common causes of masses from this region will be the carcinoma of the colon and diverticular masses. Okay, diverticulitis leading to diverticular masses. The right colon, the right iliac fossa region, is mainly due to appendicular mass, cecal mass of the cecum, and ascending colon. The kidney can give rise to masses due to obstruction and hydronephrosis, congenital polycystic kidneys, renal cell carcinoma, and in children, Wilms tumor are hypernephromas. Appendix can give rise to masses appendic due to inflammation, appendicular mass, and abscess, which are one of the most common masses in practice. Ovary can give rise to ovarian cysts or carcinoma. Pancreas can give rise to congenital cysts, pseudocysts of the pancreas, and carcinoma. All these can give rise to various forms of masses. And massive splenomegaly is another cause of abdominal mass, especially in the left upper quadrant. And this is usually due to portal hypertension, thalassemias, and lymphomas. Okay, now how do you go about evaluating a patient with abdominal mass? First, as usual, history and symptoms. You must go through the onset of the uh, swelling. You must describe the details. Eh? Onset, acute onset, or insidious chronic onset. The site of the mass, mass, size, shape, and surface. These are the important things you must know about the, 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 the mass. Okay? It's chronic onset. Insidious chronic onset is usually can be a, a malignant lesion. Whereas acute onset is unlikely to be a malignant lesion unless there is a complication of the malignancy and is usually due to infection or other, uh, other uh, inflammatory causes. Next, you go to tenderness, mobility, pulsation and consistency of the mass. This is very important. Eh? Tenderness, a tender 
mass is usually not malignant, whereas uh, non-tender mass is usually more, uh, chances of malignancy is higher. Mobility is important to see whether it is intraperitoneal uh, or retroperitoneal. Intraperitoneal masses are more mobile and they are freely moved with respiration. Whereas a pulsatile mass usually suggests some form of vascular dilatation, eh, aneurysms. And consistency is another important factor. Okay, heart consistency usually suggests a malignant lesion, whereas soft or fluctuant consist uh, consistency suggests it is a benign and cystic. Onset, as I said, acute or chronic. And the important thing is progress is important. Okay, uh, whether the lump is growing in size whether it is becoming more painful and whether it is causing pressure symptoms. These are very important to be notified, uh, detected on history. Then there is associated presenting features, especially fever, okay, suggests inflammatory or infection, pressure symptoms due to the depend the symptoms depend on the pressure on which organ the pressure is being applied. Loss of appetite, loss of weight, and generalized malaise, which are usually suggestive of malignancy. And lastly, symptoms related to the organ of origin. For example, if it is a biliary system, then you must look for symptoms related will be jaundice. If it is coming from the stomach, then we have uh, epigastric pain or vomiting. Okay, so symptoms related to the organ of origin of the mass. Having gone through these details of this important history, which are very important, then you go to the examination to detect for signs of the lump. Okay, first I said, as I said, mobility is very important. Huh? This is to be determined very carefully by detail or careful palpation. Mobility in the vertical and transverse directions and also its mobility to respiration. As I said, intra-abdominal masses, intraperitoneal masses are usually freely mobile with respiration as well as by palpation. Whereas retroperitoneal masses are usually immobile or with limited uh, mobility because they are plastered onto the posterior abdominal wall by the uh, parietal peritoneum. Then to determine whether it's pulsatile is very important. Okay, as I say, a pulsatile mass suggests vascular origin, and the most common will be your aortic aneurysm or aneurysm of any smaller vessels as well. Whether the uh, together with this pulsatile uh, mass, you have to also look for a brie, a systolic brie will suggest it is a vascular lesion. Next, we come to examination for us, whether it's a cyst or solid. This is also very important. A cyst is uh, soft and fluctuant, whereas a solid is firm to hard and it is non-fluctuant. Huh? So this is important because cysts in general are benign lesions, whereas solid Malignant lesions are usually solid in nature. Tenderness, guarding and rebound tenderness are very important, especially if it is due to inflammation or infections. For example, due to acute appendicitis, a mass that is formed is usually tender with guarding and rebound. So is a mass arising from diverticulitis on the left side of the abdomen. Next, we come to skin changes. Okay. The skin changes over the lump, discoloration, inflammation, edema. These are all very important signs that must be detected and reported by the student. Next, we come to special signs. For example, Murphy sign for acute uh, cholecystitis and psoas sign in patients with acute uh, appendicitis. Last but not least is percussion and auscultation. Very important. Percussion can help you to determine whether it is uh, contains the lump 
mass contains air, then it is most probably due to a bowel, distended bowel. And auscultation can help you to determine whether there is a bruit or increase or decrease bowel sounds uh, uh, in the abdomen. Okay, now then there are some special considerations that must be taken into account. Okay, intraperitoneal masses, as I said, usually freely mobile with palpation as well as respiration. Retroperitoneal masses, on the other hand, are immobile or limited mobility. And I explained the reason for this as well. Next, we come to the abdominal wall masses, and these will, especially the anterior abdominal masses, wall masses, masses arising from the wall of the anterior abdominal wall, will diminish with tensing of the abdominal muscles. So, ask the patient to tense his muscles, and the lumps will become less prominent. Then, cysts versus a solid, very important. Cysts are usually dull, but fluctuant, often benign. Solids are usually dull on percussion and have a higher risk of malignancy. The last one is your pelvic mass, which is also in an extra peritoneal uh, region. And classically, the masses from pelvis arise deep, deep inside, from deep inside the pelvis. And therefore, on palpation, you will not be able to get below the mass. Okay, so these are classically. Uh, pelvic masses such as uterine masses, uh, bladder masses, okay, this you cannot get below, the lower border cannot be determined. Okay, now what are the common abdominal masses that we normally see in patients? As I said, the most, one of the most common is an arising from the appendix due to acute inflammation, is an appendicular mass or an abscess. Okay, so initially it forms an abscess and later it seals off, sealed off by the small intestine and omentum to form a appendicular mass. And this is classically located in the right lower quadrant. Next, we have ovarian masses in female patients. This is another important uh, cause of abdominal mass. It can be either on the right or left side. Cecal masses usually carcinoma of the cecum, also in the right lower quadrant. Carcinoma of the rectal sigmoid region, huh? usually in the left ilia fossa. Okay, left ilia fossa mass. Carcinoma of the stomach, normally in the epigastric mass. Then from the uterus, you can have fibroid and ovarian mass, which I've already mentioned. And usually uterine masses are usually suprapubic in location. Then you have liver masses, tumor, abscesses, or massive hepatomegaly, renal tumors, and hydronephrosis. The so common cause of hydronephrosis used to be obstruction due to stones. Then you have aortic aneurysm, is mainly more on the left side of the abdomen, slightly to the left of midline, and is usually due to abdominal aortic aneurysm. So these aneurysms are usually uh, pulsatile in nature. Huh? So this can be, and they also may have a, a systolic brie over them. Next, we come to pancreatic masses. Cysts, especially pseudocysts of the pancreas resulting from acute pancreatitis. And more important is a tumor of the pancreas. Especially, the most common would be the head of the pancreas. And these patients with tumor of the head of the pancreas will be uh, present with obstructive jaundice. Then you have the urinary bladder, okay, especially in older men with uh, BPH and acute retention of urine. They will, when they come in, they will have a palpable bladder, large mass in the suprapubic region. Okay. So, and this can be either tender or non-tender, depending on uh, how rapidly the obstruction uh, has taken place. 
Again, this urinary bladder masses, enlarged bladder, you will not be able, classically, you cannot get above it, below it, and also on percussion, it will be dull and cystic. And lastly, we come to retroperitoneal soft tissue tumors. And as I said, apart from the major organs in the retroperitoneal area, it also consists of soft tissues like muscles and, and tumors from these uh, tissues can arise, huh? retroperitoneal soft tissue tumors. Okay, having taken a history and a proper thorough physical examination, you more or less come to a provisional diagnosis. And with this diagnosis, then we go ahead to do carry out some investigations to confirm or exclude your diagnosis and the investigations include blood investigation which can be routine especially for elderly patients or can be specific such as if you suspect it is a tumor in the bowel colon carcinoma you will do for CEA levels or CA99 okay these are important for assist uh, tumor markers for the various uh, tumors that you may see. Next, you come to urine analysis, looking for leukocytosis, RBC in the urine, and cytology for malignant cells. The next important group of investigations are known as the imaging investigations, among which include x rays, plain x rays, especially plain x ray of the abdomen ultrasound scans of the abdomen and pelvis which can decide whether to go on to CT scan, MRI and endoscopy. Okay, So these are all important investigations uh, for a patient with uh, presenting with an abdominal mass. And usually we do the simplest one first and then go up to do more sophisticated investigations. And the final diagnosis is you need a tissue biopsy from the mass. Okay, nowadays there are a number of methods that can be done and these are usually done under ultrasound and or CT scan guidance. Okay, to, that will give you more accurately the diagnosis from the tissues obtained from the organ of origin. And then you also have endoscopic biopsies, such as uh, EUS, endoscopic uh, ultrasonic biopsies, or through endoscopes, huh? OGDS, and colonoscopy with biopsy. So these are biopsy will give you the definitive diagnosis in particular patient. Other investigations include ERCP. Special imaging, especially radioisotope imaging. So these are done as and when necessary from the earlier imaging investigations that you carry out. Okay, now I'll go through some pictures of abdominal masses of the various types that we commonly see in our practice. Okay, this is a young man, the mass, he clinically presented with acute appendicitis and the mass, tender mass in the right ilia fossa here. Okay, so you can see there are no skin changes. The measurement is around 4 to 3, 4 by 3 centimeters in diameter, and classically it is tender and guarded. So this is a appendicular mass or abscess. Here you have got a large mass here. Okay, you've got a very large mass here, which suggests in the epigastric region. And this is a patient who looks emaciated, is carcinoma of the stomach. Again here, another patient with a right ilia fossa mass. It's an appendicular abscess with tender, guarding and mass in the right ilia fossa. Then you've got your, this patient with a large cystic swelling over the epigastric region. And this patient had acute pancreatitis and complicated by a pseudocyst of the pancreas. Okay, and in these cases, the patients will have the lumps will be uh, mildly tender and fluctuant 
and dull on percussion. And here is a large mass in the right, uh, right iliac fossa region, very vague and diffuse, and this is non-tender and mobile. So this is a patient with carcinoma of the cecum. This is another patient, mass, large mass in the right iliac fossa, which can be used to a quadricular mass or CA cecum. A good history and examination may be necessary to determine the nature of the swelling, followed by investigations like ultrasound and CT scan. Okay, now we go through some questions related to abdominal masses. So as you go through these questions, you read the questions, pause the video, and answer the questions yourself before replaying to see the answers. Okay, a 22-year-old female patient complained of right iliac fossa pain for five days. It was associated with vomiting and fever. Examination, the temperature was 38.6 degrees Celsius and the heart rate 100 per minute. There was a mass at the right iliac fossa with tenderness and guarding. Okay, here. Yeah. What is the possible diagnosis of this mass? The answer is appendicular abscess. Question number two. Name three differential diagnoses for this patient. The answer, acute appendicular mass, ovarian cysts, and mesenteric lymphadenitis. Question C. Name the imaging investigations for her. Imaging investigations are ultrasound, abdomen and pelvis and CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis. Question number two. A 62-year-old woman presents with a mass in the left iliac fossa for one month associated with bloodstained stools off and on. Examination reveals a non-tender mass 4 by 5 cm in the left ilia fossa and it is mobile. And what is the most common likely diagnosis of this patient? The answer is carcinoma of the colon, sigmoid colon or rectosigmoid colon. Okay, this will be the most commonly uh, diagnosis in this patient, considering the age with bloodstained stools and a mass, non-tender mass in the left iliac fossa. Question number two, name three differential diagnoses. These are carcinoma descending colon, diverticulitis with a, uh, with a diverticular mass, and ovarian cysts, left ovarian cysts. Question C. Most useful diagnostic investigations for the patient. This will be colonoscopy and biopsy. Question number three. A 72 year old man complained of a painless mass in the left side of the abdomen for the last six months as shown in the arrow. It was pulsatile and immobile with no tenderness or guiding over it. What is the most likely diagnosis? Abdominal aortic aneurysm, eh? AAA. What investigations will you do for them? Ultrasound abdomen and CT scan if necessary. Question C, what are its complications? These are thrombosis of the aneurysm, rupture of the aneurysm, pressure on adjacent organs, and embolism. Embolic phenomena, eh? embolism from the aortic aneurysm. Very important in aneurysm to examine the patient to see whether 
the pulsatile mass is pulsation is expansile or pulsatile. Okay, arterial aneurysms usually have an expansile uh, uh, lump, and this can be de detected on palpation. Whereas pulsatile sometimes can be transmitted by an overlying mass a lump that lies over an aneurysm. Case number four, a 92-year-old woman presented with a non-tender suprapubic mass that was resonant to percussion. She was otherwise asymptomatic and denied any urinary symptoms. What was the what is the cause of this mess? Uh, distended bladder, okay, resulting from some form of obstruction to the bladder neck. How will you confirm this? And this can be confirmed clinically by palpation and percussion. And classically, it will be dull in nature and cannot get below the lump. Okay, you cannot get below because it comes from the bladder, which is a pelvic organ. Okay, you can see the mass, well-defined mass here, suprapubic region. It is very interesting that in this patient, it is a pneumobladder. That means a bladder containing air. How does air get into this bladder? In this patient, the CT scan showed a colovesical fistula caused by diverticular disease. So acute diverticular disease causes a colovesical fistula, thereby the bladder is filled with air instead of urine. And so it is resonant to percussion. This is a very rare cause which you may not be able to detect in patients if you do not suspect them. We come to the end of this session. Thank you very much for joining me and hope to see you again in another session.